Everybody. Voila. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this episode of the Montpelier Happy Hour here on WVEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro, your community radio station. You can also find us on Emily's YouTube channel, Brattleboro Community TV, as well as Apple Podcasts if you are so curious. I'm your host, Olga Peters, and we have a great setup today for guests. We have Rosie Nevins Alderfer and Jedediah Pop, who are co-directors of the Wyndham County Consortium on Substance Use, which you will often hear be heard called uh, COSU. And we're talking today about a slate of legislation that has come before the state on reducing harm and uh, substance use disorder. I know we have been focusing a lot on COVID lately on this show and in our communities, but one thing that has not gone away is many of the struggles that people are experiencing in their daily lives and substance use is one of them. In fact, according to a CDC study, um, in a 12 month period since uh, June 2020, 81,300 people have died of overdoses. And that is up 20% more than on record for the CDC before. And the numbers um, are also up in Vermont as well. So what I want to start with, um, whoever wants to take this is, could we take a couple uh, seconds to talk about that concept of reducing harm. And what does it look like in, in practice when we're talking about substance use disorder? You wanna start off, Rosie? I was gonna ask you this. I think you should start. Okay. okay. I, think, I think you're doing well with your elevator pitch on this lately. <laughs> um, yeah, when, when we talk about reducing harm or harm reduction, as it, as it relates to um, substance use disorder. Um, for me, what comes to mind is um, meeting people where they're at. Um, I think that um, when, when we meet people's needs and we meet them where they're at, the likelihood of, of harm is, is, is reduced. Um, I think that substance use, there's, there's harm associated with substance use disorder. Um, and, you know, whether that be like, it all depends on the person. It all depends where they are um, with their use, um, the ways that they use. Um, but harm reduction would be, you know, kind of um, looking at it as a whole um, and, hopefully trying to minimize uh, those uh, the, the, this, those chances of significant harm. Um, so often people hear about, um, yeah, overdose reversal, um, the, the, the overdose reversal drug Narcan, that's, that's very common. Um, people often hear about um, syringe exchange programs, which is very common, but there's so many other ways to help um, reduce a person's harm with, associated with substance use disorder. Um, and that could be um, providing them with connections where they wouldn't have connections. That could be, um, yeah, getting them connected to, to community resources, um, getting their basic needs met um, because there, there isn't a lot of resources out there um, aimed towards uh, people in active use. Um, you know, they're, they tend to be just connected with um, this, this. I think this is my opinion, but, you know, they can, tend to be connected just with their peers. Um, there are folks who are in active use um, that are connected with service providers. But um, it, in my opinion, I think there's quite a bit of people that are not connected. Um, and because of that, um, yeah, they, they have no support with, um, with substance use disorder um, experiences. 
um, or yeah, any kind of harm reduction interventions. Um, and yeah. Um, Can I jump in I, for a second? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, go right ahead. So we've talked before on the show about like a whole variety of different pieces of legislation that are connected to the idea of legislating for the world that is rather than the world that we might think the world is or the world we want or whatever it is. And it's, um, I think in some ways that's what you're, um, what I hear when you say like meeting people where they are. And so when I think about the harms that um, are sort of connected to substance use, but not actually from substance use, um, there's things like, you know, hunger and homelessness that are connected to like sort of people losing their jobs because of substance use or people not um, being able to get a job because of substance use. And, you know, those are sort of, those are harms that don't necessarily need to be connected to those, to substance use. Um, I think about experiences with the criminal justice system that don't need to be connected to substance use, but often are. Um, and I think about experiences of shame that don't have to be connected to substance use, but often are and w like have a much longer tail even than the actual substance use might. And so when I think about, and then, you know, death. <laughs> um, and so when I think, and, you know, diseases and all of these things that I think if people were using, were able to use substances in a different context, especially opioids, um, those, all those other harms wouldn't necessarily be there. And so when I think about harm reduction, I think about like legislating for the world that is, which is people are going to use these drugs. And so how can we create community and systems around them so that all that other stuff doesn't happen or doesn't happen as much. Thank you, Emily. Rosie, anything you'd like to add to that? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, I think from a public health perspective, um, it's one thing to talk about shifting. Um, I mean, most folks at this point, not all, but many are are expanding their awareness of how the criminal justice system does not meet people's needs, um, does not reduce harm in all the ways that Emily just talked about. I think um, there's a growing push for sort of reform efforts that instead of, um, that instead of um, are sort of funneling people toward the criminal justice system, instead funnel people toward treatment. Um, and I think that the, to, to me, the misstep there or the challenge is that funneling people and, and taking away people's choice and autonomy, um, no matter what system you are, you are um, really making a choice for somebody else's life and putting them in, um, causes harm in some way or another. And, and the outcomes for forced treatment, um, so for example, programs that instead of putting somebody in prison say well you have to go to treatment and as long as you go to treatment um you know then you won't have to go to prison um that those um yield equal or worse outcomes um than voluntary treatment and so a lot of public health organizations including um, the world health organization american public health association have um been really advocating for voluntary treatment opportunities um, and I think that's where harm reduction comes in and, and to what Jedediah was saying about meeting people where they're at um, is that really by giving people autonomy and honoring their value um, and, and not forcing folks um, in, in one way or another while addressing um, harm or health concerns both to the individual and to the community that that's when um, that's when we see the best outcomes when when people's autonomy and dignity um, is honored. And I think um, there's a lot to be said for um, stages of change within within addiction and substance use disorder. Um, and I think Jedediah can speak really well to um, where harm reduction um, is appropriate in the different stages of change and where um, other options may be more appropriate um in other stages of change but really um as a as a means to meeting folks where they're at 
Thank you. Um, I, I would love to hear that at some point, uh, Jedediah, but before we, we touch on that, um, two things. One is we, we hear a lot of terminology around uh, substance use disorder. And I was wondering uh, just for the purpose of this conversation or just in general for our community, are there any terms or phrases that uh, you feel people should be aware of or, or use instead of uh, other terms and phrases we've gotten used to using? I think one, one thing that was um, pretty common for me and, and throughout my recovery is often I would hear the words um, alcoholic or addict or junkie. Um, and, uh, and, and for me, that's like saying that um, a person is the problem. Um, and so when, when I think about other terms to use other words, for me, it's about what's medically um, correct. And that would be substance use disorder. There's alcohol use disorder. Um, and there's also opioid use disorder. Um, but just substance use disorder, if we're talking about substances as a whole. Um, and that really kind of shows, um, it states that the person, um, it, it's something that the person lives with rather than something that the person is. Hmm. Uh, and that helps with, you know, internalized shame and how a person views himself. If they can separate themselves from their experiences, I know for me, it was just much easier for me to accept these experiences um, being part of my life. Thank you so much. Can I ask uh, a... Um feels a little bit like a random question, but I'm finding myself curious and I want to ask, um, you know, in the queer community, for instance, there's sort of like the taking back of queer, but queer is something that someone can call themselves. It's not something that someone else wants to necessarily be called by someone who's not queer. Um, and I think that's also like has changed in the last decade. And I'm like definitely dating myself by saying that, but I think there are a lot of, I'm using it as an example of there's a a lot of terms that are sort of acceptable within a community that's engaged in something um, or shares an identity. And then there's that would not be acceptable for someone from outside that community to use. And so and I think sometimes people get really confused when they're outside of a community and they hear the people inside that community using that terminology. And I wonder if there are any examples like that that would also be worth sharing, because I think when people are trying to use respectful language and they hear that sort of inside language, um, that's confusing for them. So I would love if we could name that too. I, I think that's a, that's a great question, Emily. And I, I, I know for me, um, if I hear people um, talking about, you know, using different language that, that are inside that community, um, like, you know, um, 12 step meetings, people will say, uh, you know, my name's so-and-so, I'm an addict, I'm an alcoholic. And I think it's, you know, I, if I still like to use substance use disorder, um, but if I'm not sure, I'll ask the person what, what is, um, yeah, what they would like, uh, what terms they would like to use. Um, I don't know if you have anything to share, Rosie, on that. No, oh, I think that's a great answer. Um, and I do, I do just wonder, it makes me think, Jedediah, some, some, sometimes you talk about um, like the emphasis also like being related to the emphasis of um, like how much value is placed on recovery and how um, at, at times that that can devalue the, the experience and even the personhood and humanity of folks who are active in their use. Um, so I also wonder if this might be related to that a little bit too have any thoughts on that that just came to mind yeah i mean i i think so i think it's related um i think when we when we tend to for me from my perspective i think you know we do put a lot of emphasis on people in recovery and and i think that devalues people who you know who whose choice it is to, to continue to use or who just they're not able to 
to make um, changes in their life due to all the other factors that play a role in substance use. Um, and, and yeah, I, I think that we, <laughs> we don't, I think it's the people that are in those early stages of change that really need that respect and that really need that dignity. And we need to start putting emphasis on that. Um, yeah, it's interesting as we've, sorry, Opa, do you need to? Oh, no, go ahead. Okay. Um, as we have, as I've been working with a few other people on developing legislation on this, um, when we think about engaging folks and inviting folks and involving folks and looking at the leadership of folks who have experience with substance use, all of the legislation talks often talks about folks who are in recovery as the people who get to speak. Um, yeah. But that's that's a certain story. Um, yeah. And so it's really it's really interesting to try to it's even interesting to try to like imagine constructing legislation and what that might mean to my colleagues if folks were actively using and being sort of and their voices were listening to I were listened to I think there would likely be some judgment there that would be really um, I would feel uncomfortable putting someone in a position to have to navigate that um, but I think it's an important thing um, and then there's also sort of the interesting legal liability of having someone sort of testify to government that they're actively using um, but I think it's really important that when we develop any kind of public policy, you're really getting sort of that full spectrum of experience. Um, but it does seem like we do. We like only listen to the folks in recovery. Yeah. And, and we really need to start listening to people who, who are in active use. And in my opinion, you know, changing the ways in which that we do, th do things to help them feel more comfortable to share their experiences. Because even for me, um, you know, I'm, I identify as a person that lives with substance use disorder, but it's been years since I have um, was using. And if I provide my lived experience on what it was like for me making, you know, those changes from pre-contemplation to contemplation to action to maintenance, um, that things have changed a lot since since then and um, if we really want to create new policies that really help people then we need to listen to the people who are living that right now um, because it, like i can kind of throw out ideas and come up with things on how to end you know homelessness and you know help meet everybody's needs but it's not going to be as uh, um, beneficial. There's another word I'm thinking of that I can't think of. Um, but I also think there's an interesting, um, you know, when we even say someone who's in recovery, um, what does that what does that mean? Is that someone who um, is taking some is in some sort of replacement therapy? Is that someone who's completely sober? Is that someone who like, is there some period of time where you some, suddenly graduate into that? Or is there someone who's like living the real experience of sort of cycling through all of those things um, for however long? And I think that becomes really complicated definitionally. And I imagine a place of like piles of judgment from even within the community of folks who have used. Yeah. We have um, about five minutes before we need to take a break. And I wanna make sure we touch on, but uh, we'll spend the second half talking about the legislation, but I want to talk about stages of change um, and, and how maybe people have different needs at different points of that, if either Jedediah or Rosie could speak to that. Sure. Um, and, and Rosie, feel free to jump in if I forget anything. Um, I, yeah, the stages of change. Um, so pre-contemplation is where um, when we're referring to substance use disorder, because it can be, I mean, it can be associated with a lot of things that relate to change. But when we're referring to substance use disorder, pre-contemplation, it's a first stage. It's where a person is active and there's really no thoughts on wanting to make that change to stop in their use. Um, or there's just so many barriers um, that, that are in that person's life. Um, 
And then after pre-contemplation, we have contemplation, which is where a person is thinking about it. They're like, well, I can see how this is damaging my life or how, how it's creating some unhealthy situations. I probably should, should stop my use, um, but I don't know how. Or I'm homeless and I, I won't be able to be in a safe space if I do stop. Um, and then comes action, um, which is where uh, a, a person decides to take action. Like they'll go to treatment, um, they'll go to um, like medication assisted treatment, um, inpatient, outpatient, IOP, which is in intensive outpatient program or partial hospitalization program. Um, and then there's maintenance where a person has stopped their use or like you were just referring to Emily, they um, identify that they are in recovery. Uh, you know, people from that live with opioid use disorder, you know, some people choose to smoke cannabis. And if they are um, saying that they're in recovery, then I think it's really important to, to, to honor that and to meet them where they're at because that could be their version of recovery. Um, and then relapse or re reoccurrence, return to use. Um, I guess return to use, if we're talking about good language to use, return to use is, um, or reoccurrence is good. Um, it can be part of that, the stages of change, um, which would bring somebody back over to either pre-contemplation or contemplation. But yeah, in maintenance and action, and even contemplation stages of change, we have so many supports here in Vermont for that. Um, people in pre-contemplation, there's really not much. Um, you know, there are harm reduction organizations like, you know, here in Wyndham County, we have the AIDS Project of Southern Vermont who runs the syringe exchange program. Um, and, and there's other programs throughout Vermont, but there's, um, I mean, we're looking at the Pyre report from a year and a half ago, two years ago. There's still people that identify there being barriers to, to, to seeking those resources. Um, so there really needs to be, we, we put a lot of emphasis on recovery and so many people have done such great work to build the recovery community up um, here in Vermont and treatment. Um, but it's really, I, I really feel like we need to strengthen our um, efforts into creating resources for people in pre-contemplation um, and honoring their choice. Um, Do I have to jump in or? Yeah. <laughs> I, I was just going to say, I think, Jedediah, you and I were having a conversation a number of months ago, and you said, like, really simply, harm reduction is health care. Um, and I think that that's so so important when you're talking about providing resources um, for folks in a pre-contemplative state of change. We're not talking about necessarily trying to force folks into recovery. If they're not ready for that. It's really about providing people what they need um, to take care of their own health care um, because health care for folks who are active in their use um, is like, like really competent, relevant health care is nearly impossible to find. Um, and I think can make such a difference to set folks up later on to just have a lot more options and choices um, for what direction they want to move in their life. So for and example, trust. And trust. Yeah. So, so the connection piece and the trust is one piece. And then there's like a very real, tangible, um, like if somebody is, is active in their use and doesn't have um, access to sterile syringes or... Um, or is experiencing um, a lot of, of like um, localized acute infections or is in need of wound care or um, is, using, is using injection practices um, that can cause vein damage long-term and there's other options available that may cause less damage long-term. Like you're setting folks up to be healthier, which in turn supports, it just gives people, when we're healthy, we have so many more choices about how we can live our lives. Um, recovery might might feel like more of a viable option down the road to folks or not, but either way, like it's just, it's so much easier to, to kind of live your, your life in the way that you want to. It's a privilege to have health um, and it should be a human right to have healthcare that is relevant to you. So I think to me, that's that's really um, so key when we talk about 
um, providing health care and harm reduction to, to folks in the pre-contemplative contemplative state of change. And to not, be, I don't want to be sort of the um, financially, fiscally minded, amoral politician here, but I think it's worth also naming yeah. that it is much less expensive to provide quality preventative care to people no matter what is happening in their life yes. than there is to provide further um, emergency department healthcare. intervention. It's constantly like, yeah, it's huge. Cost like even wound care, like untreated wounds, like you wind up with medication resistant infections, infections which is like are, really uh, difficult yeah. for yeah. our hospital system just like as one teeny tiny example mm -hmm. um so yeah there's sort of the moral argument there's the future argument there's the financial argument but in any case um it's always yeah an important thing to do well and i'm glad you mentioned that emily about long term because one of the things I always see as a reporter is how often our systems are set up for emergencies and crises only, mm -hmm. where if you caught people before it was a big crisis, your efforts and, and their trauma are, are much more easier to, to approach and, mm -hmm. and hopefully um, help them solve. And so um, I know we're about to go to the break, but just, mm -hmm. you know, I think it's, this whole stages of change, the pre-contemplation, contemplation, action cycle, as well as this idea that, you know, providing health care at whatever stage of someone's life they're at, those are all like well-known, um, important concepts in almost any area of public health you want to do or social, mm -hmm. emotional work you want to do. It's not something that's specific to opioid use. And yet somehow we always, like we continue to have opioid use in this like very specific little bucket with a different set of morals and a different set of financials and a different like whole different healthcare system. When in fact, all of these other principles are fairly universal across systems. Mm -hmm. It's just healthcare. <laughs> Thank you. We have to go to break here on the Montpelier Happy Hour on 107.7. 107.7 LP Brattleboro, WBED, but we shall be back in a moment. Stay tuned. Welcome back to the second half of the Montpelier Happy Hour here on WBEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro, your community radio station. If you are just joining us, I am speaking with Jedediah Pop and Rosie Nevins Aldifer, who are co-directors of the Wyndham County Consortium on Substance Use. And of course, regular contributor, Representative Emily Kornheiser is also here. Emily, I would love if you could give us a summary of the ver what seems to me numerous efforts before the at least the House right now dealing with things like decriminalization of substances and um, other recovery uh, legislation. Absolutely. Um, and before I do that, I would like to say that the views and opinions expressed on this show are those of the host and the guests and maybe some of the listeners if they choose to have those opinions but not of the radio station or of the tv station or wherever else you may be listening to this so thank that you that disclaimer and i also want to say jedediah and rosie you two have the nicest names and your names go very well together it's really yeah. just <laughs> quite a pleasure to look at them on the screen um and talk to both of you so I don't, you know, I wish I had written this down before we started, but however many years ago, Shumlin, um, you know, did this big, bold opioid epidemic statement. Um, mm -hmm. Does anyone remember what year that was? Oh, goodness. Mm -hmm. It was his second term, wasn't it? I don't know. I really like, I barely had time before the pandemic. I've now totally lost time. I have. Yeah, no it was like Irene okay. and then this yep. and then pandemic. Okay. <laughs> So anyway, Shyamalan did this big, bold thing, and it was, um, you know, there was the article in Rolling Stone, and everyone was so proud that the state was tackling an epidemic, um, and that we had been able to sort of show weakness by admitting we had a problem, and there was all kinds of, like, in retrospect, at the time, uncomfortable, and now even more uncomfortable, sort of self-congratulatory strange Vermontness that happened. But 
it meant that we set up this hub and spoke system, which at the time was incredibly cutting edge in terms of giving people access to certain resources, um, including medication assisted treatment throughout the state um, when there had really only been some sort of very localized solutions. And it helped us begin to have a more comprehensive conversation. Since then, we haven't really had the same level of statewide conversation on these issues, even though folks are still dying in our communities every day, folks are still becoming incarcerated every single day. Um, you know, families are struggling, our family services system, um, well, that's a conversation for another day, but let's just say our family services system is deeply impacted and impacting this issue. Um, and so all of that stuff is still going on. And um, there are a number of legislators who are working on this issue, but really sort of in isolation, even from each other in some ways. Um, and the statewide energy around it tends to either be very focused on criminal justice um, and sort of community level criminal justice, or be a very sort of like medical conversation that's sort of public health folks and some folks who are in recovery. And so um, over the you know last couple of years, as I sort of look across how this has happened in the state house, um, I'm very aware of how many different committees see this issue as their home um, or the opposite of that sentence um, and how that makes this kind of like comprehensive look more difficult. And I also know that we did some really cool stuff in Brattleboro during the pandemic that meant we were one of the only communities where for a period the number of folks dying from overdoses went down. And so it seems like a really powerful moment to be tackling this issue more broadly. And so legislation that's floating around um, in a bunch of different committees. And as I think I've said before on the show, co-sponsoring a bill is very different this year because we're entirely um, virtual. And so the people who have signed on to a bill do not necessarily reflect the people who would be in support of it. And so I feel like if people are going to go deeper into this bill, I, don't, I want to make sure I name that. There are some bills that I'm in huge support of here that I did not sign on to because they just didn't circulate in the regular way. So um, there is a bill that is intended to create more recovery housing, um, which has, in my opinion, a number of challenges with it. But I think talking about those challenges is a useful entry into parts of this conversation. Um, there is a bill that creates a legal framework to um, protect from liability folks who are creating safe use sites. There is um, a bill that expands access to um, a bunch of sort of like harm reduction tools like Narcan and fentanyl testing strips and um, wound care and a few things like that. Um, there's bills that will sort of enable buprenorphine to be more widely available in our communities. Um, some of that sort of decriminalizing possession of it and some of that is expanding um, when and how someone could access it. There are um, bills that reduce penalties related to dealing to much sort of higher quantities um, so that possession becomes decriminalized. Um, and then there's the last bill I think on my list, which I don't have in front of me, but Rosie does, which is very nice. Um, I can see it in her eyes. That um, really asks us to take a new look at the hub and spoke system and see what is missing. Um, especially, we see a lot missing sort of in the pre-contemplation phase, and then we see a lot missing in the um, sort of far outpatient recovery phase. Um, as well as looking at our needle exchange programs um, specifically and seeing how those can be expanded really to much more community-based systems. And so I think, is that everything off the top of my head, Rosie, or did I miss something? I think that's everything. Yes. Thank you. Did you mention um, decriminalizing buprenorphine? Okay. Yeah, because I had to say it, which is always hard for me. <laughs> I remember saying it. Um, so, uh, Rosie and, and Jedediah, as people who are working in the field, 
what are what's your response to this slate of of um, proposed legislation? Are there some you see that are working really well? Are there some challenges you're concerned about? Um, well, it's hard to take them all together. I think that there, there are many things. Um, I think the answer to both of those questions is yes. <laughs> um, I think expanding, um, expanding services for harm reduction to um, provide folks with healthcare and some level of safety um, for um, wherever they're at with their drug use is positive. I think um, the, uh, the, the safe consumption site legislation is a helpful um, first step for the state where, where the state to, to kind of take that on and take a public stance on that is extremely helpful. I think there are still um, numerous barriers to, to those sites becoming in actuality, um, numerous barriers at the federal level, um, but depending on where the Biden administration goes with its harm reduction agenda, um, potentially there, there could be some opportunities there. And I think that the sites that are gonna be most successful and um, best meet individual and community public health needs um, are, are the sites in places and states um, that are ready for that. Um, and, and ready and, and waiting for the federal government to kind of open up space. Um, and sorry, uh -huh. I, can I comment on that? Or do you want to have like litany, litany book? Back and Whatever forth? you want. I can match your litany or we can go back and forth. Um, I think on that one in particular, <laughs> because um, we introduced that bill knowing that this is still going to be oh, so yeah. deeply difficult, difficult yeah. on a federal level. And so I think it's important for listeners to hear that the point in doing that is to, as Rosie said, like start getting the community's head around what that would look like, what that would feel like, get us ready for that mm -hmm. if and when um, it's available at a federal level. And we do that in a bunch of different places in legislation. We have sort of a bunch of stuff set up in case Medicare got significantly mm -hmm. expanded. We have um, legislation set up for in case the feds decide to actually implement universal family medical leave insurance. So it's a it's a really important strategy for lining up state vision and federal vision. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Absolutely. And I think the other thing that I appreciate about that bill um, in particular, and, I, and it's, it's elsewhere in the legislation too, is um, the language around consumption rather than just injection. Um, I think we get really focused on, in, on injection as the only um, sort of individual and, and public health challenge. Um, and I think that um, providing opportunity for, for safe consumption of all kinds. Um, one really sees and hears and values the needs of the people who are most impacted. Um, and also um, is just a much, a much wiser public health strategy. So I appreciate that um, around those bills. I think um, the decriminalization bill was exciting to me. I've been following along on what's been happening in Oregon. Um, for folks who are unaware, Oregon just um, was the first state in the U.S. to, to pass significant um, decriminalization legislation. And, um, and much of their work around that was really grounded, again, in public, public health strategy, um, attempting to... Um, to um, yeah, really provide opportunities for, for folks uh, to access services, not necessarily forced treatment, um, but what I really liked about what's happening in, in Oregon is the focus on, on harm reduction, treatment when people are ready. It's a really, it seems to be um, a, a pretty sound public health strategy, and that just went um, statewide um, on February 1st. So there's not much to, you know, there's not much longevity to really learn from there, but it's really exciting to me to see um, that Vermont could be moving in a similar, um, in a similar way. And there are international models for that. Um, and um, generally the, the evidence that we have from places where this occurs elsewhere in the world is that um, public health outcomes are improved and um, use and crime and safety and all the things that people get nervous about when you talk about decriminalizing drugs um, actually haven't been seen to, to show a significant increase um, because it is a lot, the actual criminalization of drug use causes a lot of the harm, not the use itself, which Emily spoke to earlier. 
I think in a really eloquent way. So um, I could go on, <laughs> but there's specific things. I think one of the things that stood out that I'd like to hear from Jedediah from, uh, about is um, there is harm reduction language, I think in, in almost all of the bills. Um, one of the places it was concerning to me was in the recovery housing bill. Um, and, and there's a, there, there's a piece of that bill, um, which asks recovery houses to essentially set up their own sort of harm reduction plans or harm reduction protocols, which they need to utilize in the event that, um, somebody is, is, um, asked to leave their housing temporarily. And the way it's spelled out in the bill is essentially, um, you know, give them Narcan and, best of luck to you. Um, you don't have housing anymore, but at least you have Narcan. Um, and for the so, record, you can't do Narcan to yourself, I don't think. Exactly. So, right. And so you're taking somebody out of a community where they have su supports without housing on the street on their own um, and giving them a drug that has to be administered by somebody else. So, um, yeah, I guess I would love to hear, um, to the extent we haven't covered it already, but your thoughts on that, Jedediah, and what, like, more comprehensive harm reduction would look like, including um, how to how to meet people where they're at with a human centered approach um, and how to approach accountability within a community setting. Um, yeah, in a, in a way that incorporates harm reduction and supports. Individuals. And I'm just going to jump in because I know both of you need to to leave at two. Oh. And and so you have about five minutes, Jedediah. I just want to keep a time count there. Thank you, Olga. <laughs> Very much. Um, yeah, I mean, the first thing that that like came to me on, on reading that bill is, um, yeah, it just says, yeah, the, like the policies and procedures developing that is up to uh, just the, the, the entity that regulates the recovery housing. Um, which I don't know, I, I have a issue with that too. But I, I think like if somebody is in recovery housing and they're asked to leave, whether it be, you know, temporary or um, permanent, it's just, it's gonna impact their recovery. And these folks could have been working really, really hard for months, um, and uh, and if they're asked to leave, that can completely disrupt their 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 progress. Um, so I, I have a big issue with with that piece of it, and with the fact of that, like Rosie was mentioning, and I mentioned earlier, like a lot of people view harm reduction as Narcan, and it's so much more than just Narcan. Um, and yeah, and in in this community. Um, it's really difficult to find somebody safe housing like that day or the following day. Or and, that month even sometimes. Yeah. And then the bill, you know, it talks about, you know, having them housed somewhere else. And for me, it, it, like the community, um, having accountability on the community level. So whether that's a, a, a town, a county, a state, or even just a recovery house um, would be ideal for me. Um, I think that, you know, if, if the, the, the community or the house could help hold each other accountable um, to, to those, um, I, hate, I hate the word rules, but uh, for the sake of time, I'll say to hold people accountable to those rules have a restorative process um, involved before taking that measure of asking somebody to leave. Um, so that's what I would like to see more of. Um, and again, if somebody, going back to the stages of change, if somebody is in recovery housing, they do have a return to use or a recurrence or they like are intoxicated or under the influence um, and they're asked to leave, um, what what supports um, are are we realistically going to set somebody up with? Because that shows, you know, the, the fact that the person is using it shows that they are contemplating or not contemplating 
recovery. And so if we set them up with recovery supports, to me, that would be maybe since like I don't know somebody could feel pressured into into doing something that they're not ready to do yet and am I right that um most people you know cycle through a few times I, from you know most people move through sort of the contemplation cycle and use again um it's part of for the majority of folks like that's part of the cycle is cycling yep. through it and so it the idea of um really like releasing someone out of a community at a time when they might have the greatest need for community um right. it doesn't seem evidence-based to me if we know that folks are likely to um yeah again yeah that's yeah i mean i think that's that's beautifully said emily um like that connection um is super important and you're asking somebody to leave, they leave, where's that connection gonna come from? And I know for me, who has, I've lost housing because of this twice, not recovery housing, but just housing. Um, there is a great deal of shame. There's a great deal of fair uh, fear and there's a great deal of guilt that goes into that, that can keep somebody in that cycle you were just referring to. Mm -hmm. um, so having like, Having supports in place for that, <laughs> that's part of the policies and procedures for the recovery house. And I think it's really important. Um, I do understand keeping the community safe is important, but um, I just feel like there's a whole different, there, there could be this whole beautiful process that we're missing out on. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and just so, yeah. Anyway, so in closing, um, I don't think there is sufficient supports out there if we ask somebody to leave. I don't think it's realistic that somebody's going to find safe housing. You know, they could end up being back homeless. They could end up couch surfing, which could cause a whole nother set of um, harmful experiences to somebody. Um, and yeah, and I'd I'd really like to see um, these ideas and, and these bills like go to a committee of people that are in active use, that are in recovery, um, yeah. and and the the majority is is made up of people with lived experiences, and they and they're the ones that can um, say this is good. Or this is crap. Um, I like that idea. And so as I, you know, I think we need to wrap up, but um, as we sort of start to try as a political body to look at all these bills in relationship to each other instead of in isolation, I'm hopeful that we can um, find a way of having that kind of meaningful and um, reflective conversation with folks who are using or have used. Thank you. Um, before we let you, Jedediah, and you, Rosie, go, any last words to leave listeners with? I have so many more words. <laughs> you <Yeah, laughs> can come back on show time. Then. <laughs> We're always here every Friday. <laughs> every Friday's the party. <laughs> um, yeah, I think just just really what Jedediah said in terms of like centering the focus on on people impacted both in the broader conversation, but in the bills themselves. Like even in the bill we were just talking about, um, you know, the, it lays out in the bill that the reason that somebody would be asked to leave essentially is because that their use could impact others' others' recovery um, in the home. And yet, it's the it's the recovery housing um, uh, management that makes that decision, not the community. So it's not based on community agreements on what the folks in the community need to feel safe um, and supported. Um, to me, it speaks very much of a corrections model. It feels mm -hmm. punitive. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think both like at all the levels, both in the processes like outlined in the legislation and in the process of passing the legislation, I think there should be parallel processes of, of centering the needs of the folks in community together who are the people um, living with substance use. So 
Thank you. Thank you. Those are my last words. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, Jedediah Pop and um, Rosie Nevins Aldifer, thank you so much for joining us. We will let you go, and Emily and I will wrap up the show. Awesome. Um, Thanks but we are so us. glad you came. Thank you. Thanks for uh, having thank us. Thank you, Emily. Take care. Take care, everybody. Take care. So thank you, Emily. I know we still have a few more minutes uh, before our show needs to wrap, but I want to ask you just from a, a lawmaker's point of view, as you're watching this legislation be built, you know, it's what I'm hearing is a couple other layers of, of issues. One being just some of the, the stigma we have towards um, substance misuse in general and how we have kind of built up in the past a lot of punishment around it. Mm -hmm. um, but the other thing I'm hearing is this interesting tug between what maybe the state might want to do, but then the fact that on the federal level, um, they have a whole set of rules of what's legal and what's not. And, and so could you speak to some of those polls that yeah. you might be witnessing? Um, so definitely there's always the state federal poll, you know, we, but we, um, well, we legalized cannabis, which is illegal on a federal level. And, um, you know, Vermont's GMO legislation was considered a fairly um, controversial issue in the context of federal law. Mm -hmm. And so this isn't something that we, you know, there's always a tug. Um, interstate commerce is always a tug. Federal drug laws are always a tug. Um, and there's a bunch of other places that we're sort of always balancing those two things. And we've seen a lot of change happen across, you know, the history of America based on that tug. And, I, you know, that's probably a show for another day. But <laughs> so that's certainly there. Um, and it informs how we behave, but it shouldn't entirely shape how we behave mm -hmm. and make decisions. Um, there's another tug around how we get information about the decisions that we make. Mm -hmm. And um, so how do we bring impacted folks into the conversation? I think a lot of the time the folks who are really driving this conversation in Vermont aren't necessarily people who have used, they're people who have lost loved ones. Very good point. Very and good that's point. a really different perspective to come from. Um, I think it's a really important perspective, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it brings um, a lot of understanding and a lot more sort of emphasis on this harm reduction because um, people have seen this more up close and personal, but it's not, it's not the only story. And so right. it's really, really important to get the stories of folks who have worked with people who have used and folks who use themselves and um, again, that sort of spectrum of people who are still using and folks who are in recovery and what recovery even means. And um, there's also a real dynamic around this issue in particular, which is something that happens, um, is the Chittenden County and non Chittenden County distinction. Yeah. And I know that's no. an ongoing issue in Vermont um, around resource allocation, but this is different from resource allocation in some ways. Um, in that, you know, Chittenden County being the big city is often thought of as the place that has the big city problems and the big city solutions. But um, opioids are not just a big city problem with, you know, big city solutions. It's something that we've seen across Vermont. It, well, and, if they were, let's face it, Vermont wouldn't have a problem at all because it's yes. basically no big cities. Yes, yes. <laughs> And so, um, you know, there's the story that if anyone saw The Hungry Heart for sort of what a very rural solution, um, more rural solution looks like in St. Albans. Um, but what happens in Brattleboro is different than what happens in either of those places by a long shot, um, partly because of where we are geographically, partly because of um, how we're able to come together as a community often to have these conversations, partly because we have a really different health system. Um, because we have the retreat here and a hospital rather than just a hospital system. I think that changes a lot of things here. And so there's a real need within the legislature to sort of diversify this conversation um, mm -hmm. outside of the Chinon County nexus, outside of the folks whose um, 
and on to sort of the folks who are most impacted, the ones who use and have used. And so that sort of, those are some of the dynamics that I see playing out in these conversations. Mm, thank you for that. I really like what you said about sort of who's driving the conversation. Mm-hmm. Um, because I can also imagine that a lot of the folks who drive the conversation in the past, um, they if they haven't lost a family member necessarily, they may be people who have been harmed by um, someone else's behavior uh, while they've been dealing with substance um, disorder, uh, substance use disorder. And yeah, I'm just really sitting with how different those conversations are, Mm -hmm. how different those responses are, how Mm -hmm. different those experiences are. And so what is the solution if we want to bring more people into the conversation who maybe are actively using? How, how do we do that and, and still keep them safe when there's this cloak of criminality around it? Do you, do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, I am, um, you know, I am a um, really big fan of the working group and the study committee. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> I know that's really unpopular, um, but I think to be able to have the slow, thoughtful work in an environment where people trust each other it takes people being able to spend some time together and like you know learning what keep, makes each other tick and make decisions together and so i think that's really possible in um a working group or a study committee or something like that and i think that can be named explicitly in legislation who should be represented on that mm-hmm. um and often we say something like impacted communities and we're not as clear as we might yeah. um otherwise be and so there's that that i think is really helpful um, and possible. I um, think also something that used to be much more popular in state government than it is now that I think we've talked about before is having divisions have um, advisory committees and statute. Yeah. Right, um, right. And so I think this is a place that some of that would be really helpful. And I, you know, see the Department of Mental Health um, experience and relationship with their advisory committee to be um, really helpful to me as a lawmaker. Um, because I think it's really hard for community members and advocates to get their head around the full sort of public policy scope of a singular conversation. Mm-hmm. And so to have folks from impacted communities who are compensated and staffed to continue to focus on those issues, you know, over a period of time, I think can be really much more meaningful for everyone involved. So those are some ideas. But, you know, there's also the fact that like we need to fix representative democracy so more people can be representatives. That's also on the table. There's that too. Yes. (laughs) I mean, I think so many of our conversations go back to just that issue of how do we make sure that the people, as many people are at the table as possible. Mm -hmm. So we're hearing all these stories. Yeah. I, yeah, it's, I wonder how many years of us doing this show, it will still feel like hopeful and optimistic to come back to that point over and over again. (laughs) (laughs) And at which point we're like, can I say it again for the 80th show? Yeah. I think I can. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, I think what's keeping me still hopeful and optimistic, despite the fact that we keep coming back to that, is there, I am at least seeing more people ask that question. Me too. Me too. And, and yeah. so that's my hope for now. Me too. And so maybe that's what we should toast to today. I think is so. our... I have two different empty cups sitting here with me. I'm going to. Oh, no. I'll use this empty cup. Okay. Yeah. So here's to toasting to the hope for now and that each step will bring us forward. To hope for now. Thank you everyone for joining us for this episode of the Montpelier Happy Hour. You can find us on WBEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro, your community radio station. You can find us on the Montpelier Happy Hour Facebook page. I need my own cocktail this afternoon, as well as Emily's YouTube page and Brattleboro Community Television. Emily, if people want to reach out to you, where they can they find you? The best place to find me is by going to emilycornheiser.org, where you can find a link to all of my social media accounts, my legislative email, my political email, my phone number, or join me every Saturday 
not Saturday. Join me every Sunday at 11 a.m. for my community conversation via Zoom. And you can find the information for that on my website as well. Take care. Thank you. Have a great weekend, everyone.